Smith kick. And what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1-1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could well be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment. Hello and welcome to Kickoff, Football New South Wales' podcast for NPL and leagues competitions. My name is Teo Pelizzeri and I'm joined by my co-host Henley Warner. Henley, it's great to see you. Hi Teo, how are you going? Very good because it's finals time <laughs> and we are going back to our experts. We're going to just take a, a little peek inside our crystal ball from the start of the season, both for the NPL men's and women's competitions. Now that we've reached the end of the home and away, has it gone as quickly for you as it has for me, Henley, or is that just reflective of how little sleep I got during the Euros and the Olympics while also watching watching games during the day? Uh, definitely an amalgamation of both to answer that question. But no, it has absolutely flown past. I was thinking this yesterday. I was standing there watching Rockdale take on Mariners. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're already at the end of the season. Like, we've got finals coming up, baby. Like, this is exciting. I Yeah, I think it's been an exciting season so far. It's been really full on, especially, you know, a lot of the teams have had to play quite a, a lot of fixtures in a small amount of time. Um, but yeah, no, it's been great. Gone. It's been a whirlwind, but excited to see these finals play out. So let's get into our moments of the month since we last caught up. Henley, we've seen a few trophies lifted already, and that's where you're starting us for yes. our moments of the month. <laughs> so my moment of the month has to do with the Waratah Cup for our men's and the Sapphire Cup for our girls. So for the men's, we had RPL have a 3-0 win over Rockdale. And for the women's for the Sapphire Cup, we had a 2-1 win for the Tigers over Sydney Uni. Now, I think this year, I know for me, I thought it was a bit special because both the teams that one we're in the finals last year so they've had a bit of a vengeance they're coming back they've had that you know pep in their step they were hungry for it and with RP's loss last year against Sydney United they were they wanted it so bad they finally lifted the silverware so congratulations to them same with the Tigers I thought it was a pretty good game with Sydney Uni you know despite them losing in the end I thought they had quite a lot of quality out there mm. and in the game um oh look, so, they'll be thinking about their mistakes that coughed up the goals in that final. Well, yeah. I mean, and Tigers will happily take the trophy take <laughs> and, and not concern themselves with how the goals were scored. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But I th- yeah, I think there has to be a bit of credit given to Sydney Uni um, with that game as well. But, you yeah, know, g- great for Tigers. They finally listened to the silverware. Everyone was ecstatic, great atmosphere. And also it was right here at VSP and it was such a great vibe with all the younger girls as well, with the young kids there as well. So, yeah, I loved it. That was at my moment of the month. What about you, Taylor? Surprise me. Well, for the men's... <laughs> I am picking the team that uh, just when you think that the the nails are starting to be hammered into the coffin, just when you think that the dirt is starting to be thrown on them, just when you think that the pool is starting to be drained of all its water and they might be swirling down the drain, the Sutherland Sharks, Sharks. they came back and they did it again. (laughs) And they survived on the very last day. And on this very podcast, we spoke to Jay McGowan, I believe, last time we were here in this podcast. and. Just the laid back confidence that he had in his own ability and in his teammates' ability. I think that's a team that has been there and done it so many times before. How could they not do it again? Uh, my women's moment of the month, um, Amber Luchtmeyer, our fantastic uh, golden boot winner with 23 goals over the course of the season. If you had said to me when we were sitting here at the start of the season, she would be on the plane to Colombia for the under-20 Women's World Cup as one of the attacking options in that team, having not played in the A-League Women's before and having only scored, really, a handful of goals for the Blacktown Spartans the previous season... We would have we would have been looking forward to something extraordinary, and that's that's what we got. And it really does show what a great competition of opportunity NPL Women's is. That a player, you know, I wouldn't say unheralded because we were talking about her in preseason, and Bulls saw something to go and you know headhunt her from Blacktown Spartans, but it wasn't a huge body of work. And now she's going to be pulling on the green and gold for Australia at the end of this week, which is pretty amazing. Absolutely, I th- and she's what sixteen or something like that. Like she is. Incredible. Se- seven, I think she's turned now? 17, 17 yeah, so. yeah. Incredible player. And, you know, as we've always said, like, the youth that come out of, you know, especially the youth that are playing in our first grade division, things like that, like those younger girls, we really have to watch out for them. They're incredible. And it, it's also a story of you don't have to be called up at every age group, every rep team along the way. You know, sometimes missing out is a key part of a player's story. Absolutely. And you catch the eye of the right person, and she's done exactly that. She deserves well, every part of it. Pretty hard not to catch eyes when you score <laughs> 23 goals. But yes, that, that, that was my moment of the month. Amber looked Meyer getting picked for the young Matildas.
Stay with us on kickoff because we will start with NPL Men's. It is a marathon 30-game home and away season, and we are going right to the top with our expert to run the rule over what was a comprehensive campaign. One of the preeminent voices and preeminent experts, Tony Tanous. You hear him every week on Match of the Round, and you hear him on the big games too, like the Waratah Cup final. He joins us now. Uh, Tony, great to have you. Uh, we had you on the season preview. It's great to have you on the end of the home and away to put a bow on it. Gee, has it flown by for you as quickly as it has for me? Yeah, look, 30 weeks. I think it's our second um, year in a row now where we've had the 30-week home and, home and away season. And, yeah, look, it, once you get into it, it just flies by. And it's um, hard to believe we're at the stage at the end of the season. And, and, you know, party time for obviously our premieres and, you know, we look ahead now to the final. So incredible how quickly it's all gone. Let, let's start at the top of the table because this Rockdale team, um, to lose only four over the course of a 30-game season is phenomenal. They've won the league at arm's length. 72 points is an almighty haul. But uh, colour in, in the, you know, I've given the framework. You colour it in, Tony. What is it about Rockdale that made them fitting premiers this season and to win by seven points, no less? Yeah, I think uh, they've shown their qualities, their footballing qualities first and foremost. So, you know, the foundations were laid when Paul D took the job at the start of uh, last season. He brought on Nick Stavrilakis and Vedran Jaganchak as his assistants and, you know, they put together a formula, a template to, you know, try and bring success. And last year they fell just short. Um, they added to it this year. They built in some extra additional players, some younger younger players that had done really well at various sort of A-League academies. They also brought in some experience as well. And with that formula and the goal-scoring threat that Alec Urushevsky always poses, you know, that formula has just... Um, it's taken them to that next level. I said, fell short. They were six points behind uh, Arpia last year. And this year, as you said, they've accumulated an unbelievable 72 points and 23 wins out of 30. That is a phenomenal feat. And the resilience that they've shown throughout the season has been one of the hallmarks. Uh, a lot of their wins, uh, in, in fact, of the 23 wins, 11 of those have come by only a one, one goal, um, which just shows, and, and I think this is the hallmark of championship sides and champions, uh, you win the tight games, right? And and we've seen that over years right around the world, and, and Rockdale have really demonstrated that throughout 2024. Uh, let's be honest, though. One uh, Wednesday night at the Palace uh, with a scoreline that no one's forgetting any time soon, could you have ever envisaged that after losing to Marconi 9-0 that Rockdale would actually turn it around? You use the word resilience, I think, perfectly because doesn't it speak to the ability for the group to take that result and not let it derail their season? Yeah, absolutely spot on. I think this is the this is the thing. Oh, I was obviously behind the mic for that game. I've seen a lot over a 30-odd-year 30, 30 period in football, but that was just mind-blow. It was... You know, the yeah, you think you've seen it all and then you see something like that and, and, and it's really hard to explain it. And all those questions come to the surface. How will this team respond? You know, what will be the next, uh, you know, period for them? Um, but their resilience and their ability to sort of bounce back immediately from that, a couple of big wins straight after. I think the Blacktown City one straight after that was a, was a key win. But... Of the eight wins that they've had since that um, loss to Marconi, six of those have been by the margin, the same scoreline, two goals to one. And and it just shows, you know, just shows really that resilience and that ability to win the tight games. And that has been a real hallmark for them in the run into the finals and, and, and winning the premiership. Now, Tony, we talk about resilience and bouncing back. They did have um, Nick Stab come in and take over the team in the coaching realm. Can you tell us what do you think the impact has been of him coming into Rockdale and under this new former leadership for the boys? Yeah, look, I think it, it has been a project, and, and Nick has spoken about that to us, uh, you know, over the last month or so, just about how Paul D obviously set the template out, Nick Stav and, and Vedran Jaganchak, the assistants, you know, Nick has obviously stepped now into the role with Paul away and and he's really just the foundations that they've laid, he's been able to, 
you know, these are the guys, I guess, that are doing the work day to day. When you, when you look at when you look at the assistants, they're the ones out on the pitch. They're the ones really bringing that to the fore on a day on a day to day and week to week basis. So I think as players, you really look up to that, you respect that, and I think that's been part of that. The player, you know, they, they're f- um, former player. Nick's a former very successful player himself, so he's got that respect, and he's a former winner. So I think the players look up to that, um, and that's been a real key to their success as well. We will circle back to Rockdale when we look ahead to the final series, but let's talk about the other teams that were pushing them. Uh, although the gap in the end, I mean, seven points back to Marconi in second, and then 15 points to Arpia in third, and uh, they edged out Blacktown City on goal difference, 57 points apiece. What did you make of the title race? Because you were at Sydney Olympic when it was a, a three-team race coming down to stoppage time in the very last minute two years ago. We haven't quite revisited uh, the the cutthroat nature of the final day of the season since then, but you you can that's what made it special. You don't get that every season, and, and sure enough, we had some honest teams in this title race, but they just weren't able to keep Rockdale's pace, were they? Yeah, and I think that's it. They just weren't able to keep up with Rockdale's pace. I think for Arpia, they were the team that were probably pushing... Um, Rockdale, particularly in the first half of the season, I think they had a couple of key games that were washouts and and postponements. And then what that did was really bank up their matches. And I remember calling their game against the Sharks where they were, it was the start of a run of six games in 18 days. And, And it was play weekend, play Wednesday, weekend Wednesday. It was that cycle. And I think that's where really their season started to, you know, or their title threat started to derail because it was just too many games um, for a semi-professional level uh, banking up all of those games as for Marconi they had a real dip in the middle of the season they had a lot of injuries and suspensions and and, and I think that was really their impact but their run home and, and they kept Rockdale honest right till the end because they went on this run after a couple of key losses, I remember they lost to Olympic and they lost to Northwestern Sydney Spirit. And and it looked like their season was about to derail. They bounced back with a massive win against Arpia um, on the road, a 4-1 victory. And then they had that 9-0 over Rockdale. And that really just triggered this run home. And they were starting to get players back. So I think for Peter Tsikinis and his team, they had a great run. They probably gave Rockdale a bit, of, bit too much of a gap uh, to start with, to peg them back. But, you know, it wasn't until the second last round that uh, that we had everything confirmed. So, yeah, it, it was an interesting... I think Rockdale just set the pace um, and credit to them the whole way through. You've talked about a bit of a dip in the season with Marconi. Like, they came off that 9-0 win over Rockdale. But then if you look at their next, their next result, their fixture, they went up against Sutherland Sharks where they actually drew three... All. Now, this team, like Sutherland, they were on the verge of relegation this season. What do you think was, obviously there was something lacking in the performance there. What do you think was the reason before that? Oh, look, I think, um, they, yeah, it may have been that dip. And I think when you have such a, you know, euphoric win, a, a massive win, and Sutherland were playing for their, they, they really started to pick things up around that period. They had a great run in and obviously we know that they've now uh, managed to avoid the drop, uh, which would have been a, a big story because they've been ever present for the past two decades. So, you know, that that was a terrific performance from, from the Sharks. And, uh, you know, I think it was a one-off because you look at the results around that for the Stallions and they had a lot of success, a lot of victories around that. So, you know, I think they, they hit the finals in great form and they'll take plenty of confidence having got a couple of key players back as well. Without uh, talking about the actual matchups, which we will leave until last, what about the, the home and away seasons of the other teams that round out the top six? Because I, I remember our season preview podcast, you know, you, you always say you can never write off Blacktown City and indeed, you know, here they are in the finals. We were both very bullish about St George City improving and indeed they have and they find themselves in fifth. And then Sydney United 58, you know, one of the, the blue blood teams of uh, NPL Men's New South Wales, you know, they would expect nothing less than to feature at the pointy end of the season. So what do you make of them being the ones that make the cut and then maybe the early pace setters Wollongong dropping off uh, to miss out as the season went on and a team that I seem to recall uh, both of us being very bullish about, Sydney Olympic. They o- overcame their horror start, really, but at, at the end of the season, they still end up with more losses than wins and they miss out on the finals by eight points. 
Yeah, I think when you look at when we, you know, previewed the campaign at the start of the season, probably the big surprise packets early on were the Wollongong Wolves and the Western Sydney Wanderers who really set the pace in the opening 12 or 13 rounds. They were flying at the top of the league. They were beating everyone. And and obviously they had some turnaround in their squad and they seemed to really slide at the back end of the season. Um, Wollongong were, were in the mix. I think for me the big one – and. We did say, you know, that uh, in, in our preview that Sydney United were a bit of a smoky as to, you know, we weren't sure about exactly how they'd go. They had a massive turnover. I think they cleaned out probably, you know, 10 or 12 key players from their squad that's had so much success in recent years. And it was a big rejuvenation. So I think Gioco Kalats has done a terrific job to have that team in the top six the whole way there. If you look at the ladder last year and you compare it to the end, uh, obviously we didn't have a final series in 2023, but you look at the ladder um, last year, you compare it to this year, it's the same top five, just in a slightly different order. But, um, you know, Sydney United are the team that comes into that top six. Uh, and, and, you know, I think for me, punching perhaps a little bit above weight, given that rejuvenation. But as you said, Taylor, they're an ever-present and they um, expect they would have been very disappointed with last season. So well done to them for for making the finals. And St. George City, in only their second year in the top flight, um, no finals last year. So this is their first finals as well. So terrific achievement for them. Um, Just quick, yeah. quickly on the A-League academies, because you mentioned Western Sydney Wanderers. Now, uh, academies are always going to respond differently to A-League preseason starting up and various players uh, being allocated to them or not. I, Wanderers drop was precipitous. I know they had, you know, the disciplinary issues they had to face during the course of the season. But I mean, we spoke to Zach Sapsford on this podcast, right as that was sort of reaching ahead, and, and he still seemed pretty optimistic about the NPL team's form. And then Sydney FC and Central Coast Mariners found themselves in a, a tooth and nail struggle against relegation for most of the season. So. Did, did it surprise you that the A-League academies regressed this campaign? Because I know that uh, you and I both expected the Mariners to struggle. And if anything, you know, winning eight games is probably, I would almost suggest, a little bit overs of, of what, you know, the worst fears might have been pre-season. But on the whole, I mean, 11th, 14th and 15th, uh, did, does that surprise you that uh, that's where the three A-League academies ended up? I think for me, the big surprise was probably Sydney FC because they've been ever present towards the top of the table. Last year, I think they finished sixth and, um, you know, they probably had no inkling that they were going to be part of a potential relegation, you know, sort of um, challenge this year. I, I think given that they've been ever present, they've been, they've had, they've built this foundation over the last six, seven years, you know, where they've been consistently improving. So this was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, and, and maybe it's the turnover of player. And, and I guess that sort of next batch, it's, it's, the, the, the league is so competitive and, and you need to bring your best, you know, sort of uh, on a week to week basis. And that, that, that was a bit of a surprise. The Wanderers, uh, you know, I think they did lose a couple of key players. I think Adam Bougaria and obviously Nathaniel Blair were two, they're two prominent goal scorers in the first half of the campaign. And they both um, were recruited by Perth glory. So, you know, that was a big loss for them in terms of their goal scoring punch. And, um, you know, so that's perhaps not a surprise. The Mariners, they're trying to find their way, I guess, in the top flight. And, you know, yeah, for, their, for them, they, they finally came good, I think, under Lucas Valela towards the end of the season. And really, you know, they're probably unlucky to be in the playoff. Um, they've they've only just missed out on safety in, in the last couple of weeks. But, you know, I think all up for them, not a bad season, the Central Coast Mariners. Well, I'm glad you said that because looking at their results, they have had some pretty, like some surprising, let's say that to, for the least. We've got an Arpia win that they had, a 3-2 win over Arpia early in this season. You know, it's results like these where you really have to question and go, you know, they are quality players. Can you talk to us about that 3-2 game over Arpia? You know, Arpia in the finals. What do you think happened here? Yeah, I think uh, one of the challenges for Arpia, that was right in the mix. So that was one of their catch-up games. So that game in particular had been postponed on a couple of occasions and it became part of that pile-up of matches for Arpia. You know, the game was initially scheduled for the Central Coast, but because of the, the rain and the game was moved to Lambert Park and um, 
I, I think coming off that big comeback against the Sharks where they were really threatened up, yeah, they won that game 3-2. And Arthur DeLima, he really lit up the league in the last uh, probably couple of months. He scored six goals. He, he scored a couple in that game and, and really sort of started to make a name for himself as a, as a youngster. And, and look, uh, I think that was a terrific performance, but Central Coast were desperate at that particular point because they were really trying to pick up points because they were because of that relegation threat. Let's talk about relegation. Hills United, um, they may have started the season with a win against Sydney Olympic at Belmore, but uh, down they go with 24 points. The Mariners have the pro roll playoff against a Bulls Academy team who are bang out of form in the second tier. So if anything, you'd probably say Mariners, I well, I'm, I'm going to say it, I think they're starting favourites over two legs there in that battle of A-League academies. But how about a word on, on the teams that kept their head above water? Southo, do it again. Um, I... They, they've they turned into specialists at this, I think. I'm sure the club would love to not be in this situation every season and would love to be pushing up towards the top six. But uh, if there's a team that knows how to avoid the trapdoor, it is the Sharks. And then St. George uh, promoted, stayed up, have done so by a handful of points, but they can't complain. And then Spirit, Manly, you know, they had their concerns over the course of the year. But, you know, the table says they're mid-table and there was quite a bit of a buffer zone. So what was your take on the relegation battle? Yeah, I think it's such a competitive league. You have to turn up every week. And it was a terrific battle because, you know, at, at various points you saw Central Coast really step out of those bottom two. Hills were out of the bottom two. St. George FC were in danger. Sharks were in danger at various points. So it was a real battle, particularly in the last sort of 10 rounds. And it was a real race to get out of that uh, and try and stay out of that bottom two. So... Look, the Sharks managed to do it. They struggled for goals at home in the last month or so, but they managed to find, you know, on a key day, on the final day, they managed to find some key goals. And, they, you know, they got a, such a proud record. I think uh, it was Sydney United who might have posted on their social media. It doesn't feel the same without you guys in the top tier. So, <laughs> look, they've managed to survive. And um, it, it, it's... I think for them, though, that they will look to build that squad because they've got a spine. They've got some good youngsters who've really impressed this year, the likes of Miguel and Shuriaga. Um, you know, they've done well with Stamatelis, obviously, and Vekic as the as the real rocks for them, the real keys. But they've got some talent. Morich was another one who impressed. And it's just about building on that for season 2025 from here, I think, for Steve Zorich. Before we preview the finals, just some, some real quick fire. Uh, questions. First thing that, that comes to mind on the teams at the end of the season, who's your pro role playoff winner over two legs? Uh, if you're commentating one of the two games, I, I won't uh, bias you and, and ask you to predict then uh, if that's the case, Tony. But uh, if you're if you're just a spectator like the rest of us, who have you got, Central Coast or Bulls over two legs? Yeah, no, I think um, your point earlier that the Central Coast are probably favourites. I mean, their last two games have been tough. Um but they've shown plenty of good form over the last uh, two months. And I think with De Lima, with Bra um, Brantman, Bailey Brantman, who scored a, a spectacular Olympico in the final round, um, they've got enough quality in that front third. And, and, and the form of the Bulls is a little bit concerning coming into that. So I think the Central Coast are favourites for me as well in that one. Hills United, uh, straight up and straight back down. Do you rate their season, though, as a pass mark? Was the experience the club and the team has picked up in the top flight done them good in the long term, or do you think they will be disappointed to be heading back down? Really good question, and I tend to agree with the former statement that having spoken to Luke Cassidy pre-season and knowing that they felt that they were probably a year or two ahead of schedule to make it into the top tier. I think they would have relished the experience and I think they that will hold them in good stead as we move forward over the next couple of years. They can really continue to build. Um, you know, they've been using Landon Stadium as a base and, and going forward, they're looking for their own home um, in, the, in the northwest of Sydney, in the Hills region. And I think we will see them back at some point. That's a strong club with good foundation. And uh, re relative to expectations, your your biggest overperformer and your biggest underperformer. Who have you got at opposite ends of the spectrum? Who's who's blown you away and who's underwhelmed? Yeah, I think for me, Sydney United 58, I wasn't sure that they would be ready yet, given the 
massive turnover of players. If you think of the likes of Glenn Trafiro, Matthew Bilic, Chris Payne, Devante Clu, Yanni Fragigianis, we are talking about some of the legends of New South Wales football over the last decade. And to lose all of them in the one year and bring in some young, hungry players, maybe, you know, for me, for them making the finals and I think, uh, yeah, probably punching a little bit above weight. Um, so certainly f- for them as, as probably the biggest um, gains in terms of probably underachieving. I think Olympic squad, um, you know, I had them on the edge of the six. I, I think for me, you know, sort of they, they've got a terrific squad and they're probably a little bit disappointed, particularly with the first half of the season. So I think a club that sort of has so much history, tradition and success, they expect to be among the top four, five, six teams in the competition every year. Um, so for them to to be, you know, catching up towards the end, and, and I thought they did well on that front uh, with a few changes in the squad, they finished off strongly. So hopefully for them, that's a foundation into 2025. Talking about tradition and legacy real quick, Roy O'Donovan played his last game for Sydney Olympic yesterday. He's currently second on our highest goal scorers with 20 goals, obviously under Alec. Can you tell us what impact do you think he's made to the club over the years? Obviously a very pivotal and key player there. Um, you know, the sport's going to miss him playing there. What, what are your thoughts on him this season? Oh, he's a legend. I guess he's, you know, sort of had such a great career over the A-League and at a number of clubs. But to come in to the next tier, the the National Premier League, and I think, you know, sort of the influence that he can have at a club like Olympic and the young players around the league. And, and I know the challenge that he sort of set for Alec Gurushevsky. So this is, this is just a, a snapshot here in season 2022 it was a shoot off between those two and O'Donovan pipped him right at the end of the season for the golden boot now that motivation that that gave Alec Gudashevsky you've seen the result of that over the past um, two seasons so 27 goals last year 31 this year and two golden boots he won player of the year last year he's taken rock to the premiership so you know just the mere fact of O'Donovan coming in um, not only the the influence that he can have at a club like Olympic and the players around him, the youngsters, but more broadly in the league, I think it just such sets the uh, standard in a way. Is Gold Medal Night a one horse race, Tony? Is it Alakudashevsky and then the field, or if you had to try and pick a podium for us, who are your other standouts to be the top individual players of the season? Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, Alec clearly is the standout player, I guess. Uh, And and this is the point, right? I don't think in the years that I've certainly been involved, and if we look back over the last 10 or 15 years, I don't think there's been a player that's done back-to-back player of the year. And and so he's obviously the the favourite. And then, you know, you sort of look around um, the league. I think Marconi have had some really good players. Uh, you know, even Franco Mayer stepping in this year. He, you know, there's that, that's just one example. He's probably, you know, had a terrific season for them. Um, and, you know, you look right around the league. There's, there's plenty of quality, even, even at Rockta. I mean, you know, you look at the likes of Brendan Chalakian, who for me has gone almost back to his absolute best. I think this is probably, for a player who's been in this league for over a decade, this has probably been his best year. And even players behind him, like Isaac Danso, who I think is a, it's, it's a terrific player with a very bright future. He's been a, another standout for me and probably goes unnoticed. But, yeah, there's so much quality around the league, but Alex is clearly the standout, I think. Well, let's get into talking about the finals because uh, there is very little rest straight into it on, depending on uh, when you are listening, uh, Wednesday the 28th of August and uh, this podcast will be out with plenty of time uh, if you are listening to this maybe uh, on game day or on your way to the ground. Um, Tony, I mean, uh, you will be behind the mic for some of these, so I don't want to ask you to bias yourself or prejudice yourself if uh, you have to give us a neutral call of the game. But uh, what's your inkling for, say, Arpia Leichhardt versus Sydney United 58 at Lambert Park? Oh, look, it's such a spicy game um, every time these two sides meet. In fact, the two times that they have met this year, it's been Sydney United. Um, they played they were, while Lambert Park was under um, rejuvenation there. They used 
both Leichhardt Oval and Sydney Olympic Park. That game was the only game played at Sydney Olympic Park, and Sydney United won that one 5-1. And then in the reverse fixture, Sydney United also won that. So, look, you know, Sydney United finished six, but probably that's their bogey side up here yeah, when, when they look at it. And so this makes it a very enticing game, I think, up you're probably clever in the final round to rest a number of players with with that midweek fixture in mind. And and we saw in the Waratah Cup final, they are big game players. I feel that probably Apia have after that run of five or six games in eighteen days, it was their mind started to turn to the Waratah Cup final and towards the finals. They probably knew that their run for the title was over. And so They've shown over the years with so much experience and big games. They've won two Waratah Cup finals. This is since 2017, right? Two Waratah Cup finals. They've won two premierships. They've won a championship. They've made the Australia Cup or FFA Cup quarterfinals on two occasions, taking out some big A-League clubs. So they've got so many big game players. I think they'll be right up for that on Wednesday. And, you know, that, that game is a replay of the 2019 uh, NPL New South Wales Grand Final, which Arpia won in extra time. So they're always spicy games. You know, I'm not riding off Sydney United 58, but I think Arpia probably with that rest and, you know, home advantage probably do go into it as slight favourites. And if we have a look at the other elimination semi-final, we've got Blacktown City taking on St George City at Landon Stadium. Um Obviously, Blacktown's had quite a successful season. St George City again; they've had they're doing well. What is your take for this game? Oh, I called the game between these two in the opening half of the season, um, and the spice. I think three red cards. Um, you know, not trying to build it up just for the sake of it. I think it is genuinely spice when these two sides meet, and there is a bit of history. Atek Gench uh, was a former Blacktown City manager. Mirko Ural was his captain at the time. Um, and so there's a history, you know, sort of between the clubs. And I think, you know, whenever these two sides meet, they've sort of shared the results this year. So I think it's going to be an absolute cracker. Um, Blacktown City have hit form. They're at home. They probably go into it as favourites. No more Jason Romero for for um, St. George um, City. He's, he's moved to Indonesia. So, look, they've still got plenty of goal-scoring punch, I think, with Jesse Foti in good form, Paolo Mitri and Costa Petrados, there's there's still plenty of punch for them in that front third, but Blackdown City for me, with getting Lachlan Campbell and Adam Berry, who they missed for large chunks of the season, they've just come back in in recent weeks, and I think that that sort of sets them up there. They've made a couple of good statement victories coming into the finals over Marconi, and then on the weekend as well over Hills, so that probably gives them some good confidence coming into the finals, so... I think they're probably just starters' favourites. And last one, um, it hasn't been the greatest season for our NPL New South Wales contingent in the Australia Cup, which I must say is surprising because unlike the previous two seasons, we actually sent most of our top end of the table uh, from the top flight to the national rounds this time around. Do you give the NWS spirit any chance on the synthetic against Melbourne Victory, who... Yeah, I, I've watched some of their preseason friendlies. They've they've looked a little bit, you know, working through the gears. It would be, uh, I think, with all due respect to the other sixteen cup sets to have happened, the biggest in the competition's history. If Spirit were to pull it off, do you give them any hope on uh, Wednesday <laughs> night out at uh, yeah, Christie Park? I think it's 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 a it's a real mouthwatering fixture because you know Christie Park is a little bit different in terms of its dimensions. And in David Perkovich, you've got. A manager has proved, um, you know, he's one of the up-and-coming managers. He's proved, particularly in Cups football, that he can really tactically come up with a game plan to really, um, you know, sort of test uh, test opponents. I mean, he won the Waratah Cup a couple of years ago against the much more fancy Sydney United 58, and you know, a great Cups team. So, so I do give them a hope, and I wish them all the best. Um, you know, they probably don't have the quality and and the budget of other big NPL New South Wales clubs, but they're going to go out there. They're going to have a crack, and they're probably going to come up with a game plan to try and really test the victory. And you know, I hope for NPL New South Wales they can do the job. I feel probably this year it's been difficult for the NPL clubs with that banking up of games. I, 
I just felt they probably didn't go into round 32 with the freshness that they would have liked, the likes of Arpia and Rockdale. And that probably was to their detriment. I think uh, I don't know the, a way around that and whether the fixturing and scheduling can free them up a little bit more to have a real crack at it. Um, but I think that was the big big issue for some of the bigger teams in, in the Australia Cup this year. No, I mean, you're dead right. Uh, whether it's a midweek game against an A-League team or a midweek trip into state, they are not easy. And that is why they are memorable when you do go on a good cup run. Tony, we'll continue to hear you behind the microphone and see you on the NPL New South Wales and Football New South Wales socials throughout the course of the men's final series. Thank you for joining us and giving us such a, a comprehensive rundown of the home and away season. Um, we've been uh, plying you with questions, though. Free hit, a final thought before we uh, wish you good day. Yeah, I think one of the big things for me is whether Rockdale can really, their focus has been on um, the, the premiership very much so. Uh, you know, the finals, now they've got to change their mindset. And that real that real thing about MPL New South Wales, very rarely do teams that win the premiership back it up and win the championship. And that gives, you know, the Marconis, the Arpias, Blacktown cities for me, a fighting chance in the finals, but Rockdale, can they shift their mindset, you know, after winning that premiership and really set out for a two-game sprint to the double? Tony Tanous, thank you so much for joining us on Kick Off, the Football New South Wales League's podcast, and we look forward to hearing more of you through the final series. Great to chat, Teo and Henley. So a big thanks to Tony Tanous. Don't forget the Football New South Wales YouTube channel is where you can watch all of the previous games. You would have heard us make reference to any number of games through the course of the season there. Highlights, packages, full match streams. The Football New South Wales YouTube channel is where you can go to watch it all. And it's also where you can watch the live games, which will be exactly the same for the women's competition, which we will talk about next. So on kickoff, it's time to turn our focus to NPL New South Wales women's. And at the end of a 26-game season, well, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But it went right down to the very last day of the home and away season. And two people who were there were my co-host, Henley Warner, and behind the microphone, uh, commentator and also uh, media all-round expert, Nicola Posda, who joins us on the line. Nicola, great to have you back on kickoff. Great to be here, Taylor. Thanks for having me. And Henley, unfortunately, we were wrong. Yeah, I know. Let's let's get into that later. <laughs> well, you know what? We, we had an, a really epic season at the end of uh, a 26-game home and away campaign to come down to a season decider. Credit to the fixturing, but also credit to just the theatre of the occasion. MacArthur going to Lambert Park and defeating Arpia Leichhardt to secure the league by five points in the end. Arpia needed to win to leapfrog them. Nicola, talk us through what was a, a f sensational culmination of the home and away season yet again in this competition. Yeah, look, it was exactly what we hoped for. The final, the second last game of the season, we, I was doing the MacArthur Amherst Pools Academy fixture and I was just hoping that results would go exactly as planned and that the final day of the season will come to a head where it was and it was just, it was, it was a great atmosphere, first and foremost, at Lambert Park. There was five, 600 people there. There was Arpia Leichhardt fans. There were MacArthur Ann fans. They were singing left to right. Like, it was just fantastic. It was a real occasion, a great advertisement for women's football, first and foremost, as well. So it was, um, it was a spectacle. In the end, MacArthur, I have to say, deservedly have taken out the premiership. They've been phenomenal in the last... In the second half of the season, really, they kept nine clean sheets in 13 games and they just seem unstoppable, unstoppable at the moment. And moving into the finals, I think Stephen Peters' team is really onto something. Well, talking about MacArthur for a sec, they what was 11, now 12, um, undefeated. Uh, you know, the last they've been unfeed last 12 rounds. Talk to us about that side because obviously they are oozing quality over there, not just within the plays, but we've got Stephen Peters going off to Perth Glory as well and Kelly Brown joining him over there. So talk to us a bit about this squad. What what were some of the standout performers in this squad for you this year? Well, I have to say that there was a bit of a blip mid-season and the question was, were they going to recover from it? There is a, There are a team with a lot of superstars, really, and the question always was, can they recover from that drop in form? And my word, did they? They they did not stop. It just kept improving week after week. And like I said, they became unstoppable at the end. Kelly Brown's been scoring in the last few rounds. 
it wasn't a prolific season like the one before, but she's really found her goal-scoring touch. Bethany Gordon and that midfield with herself, Mel Caceres, um, Darcy Malone, they're just running over teams through the midfield. I have to really make special mention as well to Madison McComiskey and Maya Lobo at the back. They have been phenomenal in front of a excellent Theresa Morris here. And it's just hard to really pick out one player because this whole team has so much quality. And I was thinking about it last night. I'm almost, almost going to say they are the greatest female football team in New South Wales, MPL, ever. They're, they've created a dynasty here. We had Sydney University when Heather Garriock was in charge. They were flying through the competition, but this is, this is something else. I don't know if it's ever going to get repeated again. It's a, it's a huge call, mainly because history judges that Sydney Uni team so well, Nicola, in that they they literally had two Matildas, Courtney Fine and Remy Simpson, playing for them in some of those years uh, before, obviously, they went on to bigger and better things. And th- this MacArthur team, it's a different age profile. It's you know, You've got you know, someone like an India Briar, but they're not all players on, on the rise. There are players that are very much in the, the window of the prime years of their career, you'd have to say. And I think that's what makes them such a, such a competitive team week in, week out. No, absolutely. And I think when you have players like Mel Caceres bossing that midfield and being that real connection between the front third and the midfield, but also a real proper leader, they're just too good at the moment. And I know there's no current Matildas in that squad. There's a lot of young perspective players coming through as well. I mean, we've seen Tegan Bertolicio. She's join the young Matildas at the World Cup as well now in um, in Colombia. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of quality coming through the squad. Their, their reserve team has a few good players too. Um, Tao Mochensky comes to mind off the bat quickly. So they're, they're definitely a team that's growing in terms of players that will make names for themselves in the future. But they have that, that experience in the side as well. Of course, Tanil Hayo. I can't not mention her. She's an absolute leader of that squad as well. Now, Nick, at the start of the season, you and I were now looking a bit like fools in front of Teo, but you and I were backing Arpia with their season and it's been quite successful. However, just in the end, they were pipped. The one thing I do want to talk about, though, is their 3-2 loss to UNSW. Now, UNSW obviously were promoted this year. It's been a bit of a, you know, all over the place season for them as well. But chat to us about that game because... You know, just from there on, do you think that may have had a bit of an impact into their gameplay for the rest of the season? Because it was only just in August that that game happened. So what are your thoughts with that? Well, I actually think it happened a couple of weeks prior to that when they, they lost to the Illawarra Stingrays 3-0. Um, and that sort of led into this game. They were short in players as well. I mean, Ashcroft is so important for them in the front third. And losing her for six or seven weeks through a really serious rib injury hurt them. Um, same as Tash Pryor. She was playing injured or on limited minutes for a long while there. The same can be said for uh, Sophie Hoban, who, who played sick yesterday. So they haven't had a real full squad to pick from in the last six to seven weeks. I think that's sort of played on their form as well. Um, but look, coming into finals, they're a team with quality players across the park as well. I do think if there's one team that can challenge Arpia for the championship, it is them when they're full strength, though, because this MacArthur team is just, like I said, they're, they're, they're unstoppable right now. But Arpia is probably their, their closest challenger. A couple of great stories round out the top four. Illawarra Stingrays, I think, reflecting what has been a, a really rich uh, run of talent going to the A-League women's and to youth national teams out of the South Coast region. It's been reflected now at NPL level with the Stingrays having the season that they've had. And then Sydney Olympic, one of those teams that, going back to our season preview, I seem to think that we had them firmly in the too-hard basket because they'd done a heap of recruiting and we didn't know what to expect. And in a fairly hot contest to make that top four, they were the ones that uh, were able to get over the line. Look, I have to take my hat off to Jeff Abrahams. He, from my perspective, is the coach of the year. Um, Without a doubt, he's really built this squad from a team that struggled last season to a team that's made finals. They had a very, very poor patch, but 
when you look at what players he had at his disposal, he had to use a lot of youngsters that probably aren't ready to step up just yet, but that affected the squad greatly. And in the end, the last three weeks, I mean, or the last two, three games, I should say, they've put off some good results and they will make it difficult for MacArthur in the finals. They deserve to be in the finals. They were in the top four all season. Um, and it's it's well deserved for Jeff Abrahams and Sydney Olympic. But for the Stingrays as well, just quickly, they they haven't played finals football for a long time. And like you said yourself, they're a team with rich history. They come from a rich a pool of talent, really, at, at, down at the South Coast. So to see them back in the top four, to see them back in finals football is is fantastic for the women's game in the South Coast region. Now let's have a look real quick, a bit further down the ladder. We've got your Spirit, your Northern Tigers, Gladesville, but I want to focus in on Tigers. You and I were at the Sapphire Cup game where they played uni. Obviously last year they played it, they were just pipped at the end. This time they turned victorious. What are our thoughts on the Tigers sitting in at fifth this season? Look, I think that they, they came close enough. Um, Sydney Olympic just got the results right at the right time. Um, but the Northern Tigers, look, I think if they look back, they'll say that this was a successful season for them. I mean, winning silverware is extremely important. It's something that's eluded them over the years. They haven't been able to, to secure any. They've lost countless finals. And they've finally got the job done now. So I think that this will be a real boost to them moving forward, knowing that they finally can leave silverware. Um, and I think next year they'll come back bigger and better and stronger. Now, obviously, only one team gets relegated and it's done on the basis of the club championship. It was apparent from a number of weeks ago that was going to be Blacktown Spartans. In a sense, it's the end of an era for the Spartans. Obviously, they've had extensive player turnover over the last four seasons uh, with the, the names that have gone in and out. Uh, are they the sort of club now that can consolidate and bounce back or is the incredibly tight funnel at the top of League One one that uh, means they might need a season or two of consolidation before they can uh, rise back up to the top flight again. Look, it's going to be it's going to be very tough for the Blackdown Spartans. I mean, the last year they survived on the final day. This year they they were relegated two rounds before the end. Um, that Union New South Wales win over Arpia sort of their fate. Um, if you look at that football New South Wales League One competition, I mean. The SD Raiders won the won the league. They were premiers. Um, you've got other quality teams in there: Central Coast Mariners, um, Bankstown City Lions, St George FC. These are all teams that have been the competition. They know what that competition's about. They'll be as strong, if not stronger, next year. It won't be easy for the Spartans, in particular, if they can't retain the quality that they have in the squad. I mean, we've seen what's happened to Bankstown this year. They weren't able to to bounce straight back up. So it'll take a lot of work. It'll be very difficult to return immediately to, to the top tier. Um, but it's, it, now it's a question of the character of the club too. How do they approach this being relegated? What's their, what's their steps moving forward? And then what are your standout stories from the mid to lower um, teams, the teams that ultimately fell short of the finals race. I mean, yeah, the carrot was dangled to a lot of them for quite a lot of the season. Yeah, Gladesville, Bulls, they weren't out of the conversation until only, you know, the last couple of weeks. And then, you know, the ones that were a little bit further back, Manly, Sydney, Uni. What will stick in your memory about season 2024, about some of the teams that, uh, you know, were too a cut above the relegation race, but weren't quite in the top four conversation? Well, we'll start with Manly. Manly had a great start to the season, but they fell off and they came back well in the latter part of the second half of the year, but it just wasn't enough. Uh, they left it too late and I don't think they had the legs in the end to get over the line. I'd say Gladesville was one of those teams you sort of expected to make the four. They were playing good football. They were scoring lots of goals. But in the end, again, a few inconsistencies. They, they fell off a little bit earlier. But for me... The real story of those mid-range teams is no doubt Northwest Sydney Spirit. They were they were fantastic all season. Uh, Tony Candy did a fabulous job with them. When you look at the players they had in their squad, I mean Talia Yunus, what a superstar that girl is. I'm not sure I've seen a player with technique as good as her in a very long time. She's one to definitely keep an eye out on. I um, mean, particularly in the A League women's season coming, 
I think she'll start to make a name for herself. Sarah Morgan, obviously, she returned back to the club. She was fantastic in midfield. And you've you got to look at the players that have been here for years, like Aaron Pridmore, um, a true captain, a true leader of that side. And you can keep going through the list. Morgan Roberts, also been there for years. Um, El Abdul Massey had a phenomenal season. So they were really good. And to be honest, I'm a little bit sad they didn't make the finals because I feel like their football and their development deserved that. If you look at them from round one through to round 26, there was enormous improvements, improvements made to the squad. And again, Tony Candy did a fantastic job with his side. Now, if we look back down a bit further down the table, we've got Bulls FC Academy in particular. Amber is leading the top goal scorers with 23 goals ahead of Isabella Habuda. Talk to us about Amber. I think she's been a standout player this season. I said it a few podcasts ago. Absolutely love her. And also with her transition now into the A-League women's space, what has been your main your key points to take away from Amber this year? Well, look, she, she broke onto the scene last year, right, with the Blackdown Spartans and we saw her score some important goals and more or less she kept the Blackdown Spartans up on her own single-handedly as a 16-year-old, I believe. So making the move to the Bulls FC Academy this year, she's gotten even better. So the scary thing is how good is she going to get moving forward? Um, signing with Sydney FC is a massive step forward in her career as well. She's also away with the young Matildas at the Under-20 World Cup in Colombia. So She's on the world scene now, has the opportunity to really explode. Um, and I think we're in for a very, very special player. Another one produced in New South Wales and another one that will make a mark on the women's game, no doubt. Now, if we have a look to our finals, we've got our RPR taking on Stingrays and we've got Olympic taking on MacArthur Rams. Who do you think are going to win these matchups? And then when we get to the final, like at Combank Stadium, who's taking home the gold? Well... First and foremost, how exciting is it having the women's final at Combank Stadium? These ladies Insane. absolutely <laughs> deserve that. They've worked so hard for it this year, and to put them as that showpiece event at Combank Stadium, it's going to be awesome. Really looking forward to calling that one. Um, in terms of the matchups, look, the MacArthur Rams, like I said, uh, I'm getting a bit repetitive with it, but they're unstoppable right now. I think Sydney Olympic will give them a good game. They're almost at their full strength which is good. They did beat them earlier in the season as well. It was one of the Rams' worst games, really. Um, but Sydney Olympic stuck to their guns. They did their job. Jeff Abraham set them up well, and they beat them 2-1. Um, the second game, though, was really one-way traffic. It was a comfortable win for MacArthur. I think they will have too much for Olympic. So I, that's one of our finalists uh, in the other game. RPR Leichhardt's bogey team over the last few years has no doubt been the Illawarra Stingrays. Um, the Stingrays, like I said, are back in finals football. They deserve to be here, but they'll be without one of their key players. Hayley Taylor-Young was sent off yesterday, so she won't be available for selection. How will that affect uh, the Stingrays? I'm not too sure. They do get back Siobhan Edwards who returns from a overseas holiday. So that'll be a welcome addition. But again, RPA at full strength with Ashcroft leading the line again, Sophie Hoban perhaps dropping a little deeper into the 10 roll or playing out wide. Um, Tash Pryor coming back into the defence and setting up that wall in front of Sally James. I think they'll have just a little bit too much for the Stingrays. And again, their midfield as well. You look at their... Estelle Fragale and, and Mona Walker, like they are amongst the best midfielders in the competition. I think they might have a bit too much for the Stingrays and we may see a replay of last night's game or Sunday night's game. Um, MacArthur and Arpi in the finals, my tip. Last one, Nicola, and it is to do with uh, the individuals. Now, we've spoken about the Golden Boot Race, but who do you think will end up on the podium at gold medal night because we know that uh, the award has just, you know, nudged towards high scoring players in previous seasons, but you have kept a keen eye on this competition. If anyone's going to pluck out a defender or a midfielder or even a goalkeeper to be right up there at the pointy end of the count, it will be you. Who do you think will be challenging for the podium uh, in the medal count this season? Well, 
I was just about to say what, what you said. Usually it's the goal scorers they get there. But when I look at that MacArthur Rams team, I can't look beyond the, the two centre-backs. They've been phenomenal, McComiskey and Lobo. Uh, but also that midfield three of Malone, Caceres and Gordon. Gordon's got a couple of red cards this year, though, so you can't pick her. Well, let's hope she um, doesn't get any in the semis of the final uh, because she's important to the Rams. But it, it could go any of those other four. Um, I, I think that they deserve it. Will they get there? I don't know. Like you said, usually it's the goal scorers, but my tip would be, without a doubt, one of four of McComiskey, Lobo, Malone and, and Caceres. Well, Nicola, thank you for all the work you've put in both behind the microphone and also with the written word over the course of the season. We know that we'll continue to see you on the Football New South Wales and NPL New South Wales social pages through the final series leading up to that grand final day at Combank Stadium. Enjoy the final series. I know that uh, the players and certainly the fans will be on that journey. And thanks for joining us on kickoff as well. Thank you both. And I'm really looking forward to the final at Combank. So, Henley, one last matter of business before we say goodbye. Uh, we heard from Nicola in the chat there about the Women's uh, League One, that SD Raiders did get the win uh, at the end of 26 home and away games, 66 points, Mount Druid Town 65, and then Bankstown City third on 68. And uh, also the Men's League One competition, which we have stayed across through the course of the season. We, we spoke plenty about that promotion relegation playoff between second-placed Bulls Academy and also second-last-place Central Coast Mariners, but that is because Mount Druitt Town ended up six points clear on top of the league, 66 points, Bulls Academy on 60, and also, again, Bankstown City in third on 59. So congratulations to Mount Druitt Town. Excellent season in the second tier in both men's and women's, and their men, after the disappointment of getting relegated last season, bounce right back up. And we, we did hear during the course of the season on this very podcast about some of the changes they'd made, uh, they only lost four games out of 30 over the course of the season, Henley. So clearly, uh, they showed a lot of character to bounce right back. Now, we have grand finals to look forward to at the end of this final series. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think it is going to be an absolutely huge day. We have an amazing venue lined up for everyone. We have the Combank Stadium on Saturday, the 7th of September. All I have to say is be there. If you're not there, you are absolutely missing out. Our National Premier League, the best talent in the state, will be on display there. I think this is a, a huge, I know I said huge earlier, but like this is insane. First time back there since 2022 as well. Um, after the uh, no final series last season. And of course, the it's now a men's women's double header. In 2022, it was a, a men's triple header with the youth age groups. So a little bit different, and hopefully, uh, regardless of who qualifies, lots of people coming along to have a look. Well, if you want to be there, girls kick off. We have our grand final at 2 p.m. And for our men's, we have kick off at 6 p.m. So be there, be a part of it, and cheer on your team. It's been a bumper podcast. Henley Warner, thank you for joining me once again. Thank you for having me, Teo. My name is Teo Pedlazeri, and don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Rate us five stars while you're there as well. This has been Kickoff on behalf of Football New South Wales. The overhead kick, and what a goal it was! Stewart makes it 1-1. And it is a gorgeous little chip. This could all be the moment. Yeah. It is the moment.